So we're going back to the, the message series that I started last Sunday called Transformers, and this is part two of Transformers. I mentioned last Sunday that our mission statement at Freedom Life has been since we launched, in fact, it's part of the reason why we chose the name Freedom Life for our church, our mission statement has been helping people find their way into freedom for all of life. But over the past, well, the past couple of months, few months really, but particularly the last few weeks, our pastor's team has really been talking a lot about refining our mission statement, refining what is our vision? What are, we, what are we really here for? Not only what do we get up to do in the morning on a kind of a, near, a near-term basis, but what are we doing long-term? And so one of the things that we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of months, and I've even been preaching a lot about, and it's a part of Kingdom Leaders Masterclass as well, is that a huge part of what we're after is helping see people become transformed. And we mean transformed family transformed, I'm sorry, transformed people, transformed family, transformed church, and transformed culture. Now, the reason we're talking about these four parts or four areas of transformation is that the kingdom of God cannot fully come in the world, in the nations, without each of these four pieces. If you miss any one of these four, the kingdom of God cannot complete its mission. So if you have transformed family, church, and culture without transformed people, well, obviously that's not real transformation. It can't be sustained because all transformation starts in the heart. So we need transformed people. But if you have transformed people, but they don't take that transformation home, and we have little individual bits of transformation within families, but there's no generational transformation, then it can't take root in the world long term. So how many families do we know where grandma was, a, was an amazing Christian and no one else? It's like she was a wonderful woman of God, but it didn't catch generationally. Now, I believe the Lord is going to honor her faith, and at some point it will catch in her generations. But we don't want to be just little, you know, little islands in the sea. We want to actually see transformation come into our families. We need generational momentum. That's the only way the kingdom can come. It's generational. And this is why we can't just be thinking about a five-year plan. We have to be thinking about a 500-year plan. We have to be thinking in terms of what does this look like 10 generations from now. And we have to get things going in this, in this generation that will accrue like the blessing of Abraham into every generation that follows. And we have to turn the momentum away from generational curses to generational blessing. That's what we have to see happen. So we need transformed family. Then we also have to have transformed church because traditional church, institutional, ecclesiastical kind of church has become a very different thing than Jesus originally envisioned. And the only way the gates of hell shall not prevail is if upon this rock I build my ecclesia. So we have to have a transformation of ecclesia. And what's very interesting about this is that transformed ecclesia is actually rooted in transformed family. Now we're going to talk about this a bit in Kingdom Leaders Masterclass, specifically in February. I'm sorry, in March. We're already in February, aren't we? So in March, we're going to talk specifically about the, the symbiotic... And that literally means bios is a life system, like biology or biological. So a symbiosis is two life systems that depend on one another, like an ecosystem where two life systems depend on each other to survive. So the symbiosis between church and home, or in biblical terms, to use the Greek language, the symbiotic connection between ecclesia, which is church, and oikos, which is house. And you'll see it in the book of Ephesians. Paul weaves these two together. And he even says regarding the marriage of a man and a woman, I'm, I'm not really talking about marriage of a man and a woman, but I'm showing you a mystery. I'm talking about Christ in the church. And he integrates the two ideas. If you look back to Acts chapter 2, they were daily in the temple and from oikos to oikos from house to house. So there was literally an integration. So this is why we say transformed people, 
transformed family, which is understanding that our household is the jurisdiction of King Jesus, and then transformed ecclesia, transformed church. But then that cannot finish its work if it does not take root in the culture. It's not enough for us to box this thing up and just have heaven on earth only in our local churches or only in our homes. It's got to go out into the workplace. It's got to go into the marketplace. It's got to go into what Paul calls our metron. Boy, I'm preaching good right now. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? It's got to go out into the metron. It's got to be salt and light in the world. What good is a candle if it's under a bushel? So what we have right now is wonderful in this room, but if we don't get this light out into the darkness, it's not doing much good. Okay, so we've been talking a lot, then our pastor's team, we've been talking a lot about transformation, transform people, transform family, transform church, and transform culture. And we've been saying that this is what we live and breathe for. This is why we're on the planet. This is why Freedom Life has been planted in Mansfield. We actually have an assignment to steward that mission. It's on us to say, how can we set these things in motion? And this is why we're this is why we're here. This is why we exist. So we've been actually rethinking and talking about rephrasing our vision statement. So for the last six years, our vision statement has been, as I mentioned last week, helping people find their way into freedom for all of life. Kind of has a nice rhythm. I like that. But I'm about to disrupt the rhythm. Because here's what we're changing it to, helping people live free as transformed people, family, church, and culture. Now, I understand it's a little bit wordier, it's a little bit more of a, of a wordy statement, but I think it captures everything we need to say, and I want to take a little bit of time and explain why this concept of live free, helping people Live free. You've probably seen live free all around you. You've seen it in the lobby, in the neon lights. You've probably seen it on the merch. If you haven't picked some up, grab some before you go. It's a good conversation starter everywhere you go out into the world. Wear that hoodie. Wear that sweatshirt. Wear those t-shirts. Put on the ball cap and tell everyone everywhere you go, live free. It's on our website. It's on little bracelets that we wear. It's everywhere. Live free. We're going to even emphasize it even more in the coming season. I told you we're ramping up for Easter. And as we do, we're doing a mailer that's going out to 3,500 houses. We're doing Google ads and Facebook ads and everything we're doing. If you can see our, and I'll show you, um, I'll show you an example of it in a couple of weeks. But when you see the mailer that's going out, we're going to put invitations in your hand. And it's all about live free. Live free. Live free. Live free as transformed people, family, church, and culture. Now, why is the whole live free idea such a big deal? In fact, the very first Sunday when we launched, September the 10th, 2017, I started a four-week series called, can you guess it? Live free. That's exactly right. And we've actually revisited that idea again and again. But it is the heart of what we are. Our church is called Freedom Life. But to live free is not just to improve your quality of life. In other words, we're just going to try to help you find freedom in Christ so your life gets better. No, we mean specifically that there is a need to live. The idea of live free addresses the root problem of the human condition. Now stay with me. I want you to think this through with me. Live free, both words, live and free, address the heart, the root, the core of the human condition. The human condition is that we are dead in our sins and trespasses before Christ saves us. We are dead in our sins and our trespasses. So what is needed for humans is life. You remember a few weeks ago we took a field trip and we went to Ezekiel chapter 37 and we traveled in the Spirit on heaven's airlines and we arrived together as a tour group and we marched to the precipice 
along the edge of the mountain, and we looked out across the valley below, and there in Ezekiel chapter 37, with number 21, Zeke himself, we stood over the edge, we looked over the edge, and we beheld a valley of dry bones. And that valley of dry bones signified Israel, who because of idolatry and sin had become dead, not only dead, but destroyed, their bones scattered like an army that had been slaughtered in battle, and now the bones had bleached in the sun. And so the Lord says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And he says what we all should say, Lord, you know. You know, I, I don't want to project my expectations on you in this, in this signal moment, but I want to come into alignment with what you know. I know what I think. I know what I want. I know what my, I know what my family tells me they'd like to see happen, but, but Lord, you know, and he comes into alignment with God's thought, to think God's thoughts after him. And then the Lord says to him, prophesy to the bones. And he says, oh, dry bones, with a little bit of vibrato, oh, dry bones bones hear the word of the Lord. I will breathe upon you and you will live and sinew shall come upon you and flesh shall come upon you and skin shall come upon you and I will breathe into you and you shall live. He said it twice for good measure. I will breathe it into you and you shall live. And then he said, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. This is the need of all humans to live. We sang about it today, our living hope. Death has lost its grip on me. The human problem is actually death. In fact, if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it will tell us not only the problem, but the solution to our problem. It will tell us what is the root human condition. Hebrews 2 and verse 14, since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise, talking about Jesus, shared the same thing. So Jesus came into our existence and was incarnate in flesh and blood and became mortal, though he is the eternal son of God. So the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things so that, here it is, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free, there it is, free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what's often called original sin, or basically, what's the root human condition? And there's a lot of discussion about that. But the most biblical framework for understanding why all humans fall into sin is simply this. All humans are born mortal. We're all born dying. And Paul said that the sting of death is sin. So in other words, when you're born, and you're born mortal, and you're born dying, you are immediately stung by death. And the venom that death releases is sin. It's a cart and a horse issue because a lot of people believe that we're born into sin, therefore we die. But the scripture actually says it backwards. We're born dying, therefore we sin. Now why is that? Because when you're born mortal, you're born with the fear of death. A baby who is newborn doesn't even know his name or her name and yet will begin to cry as soon as they're born into this world, begin to shake begin to reach out for comfort. They can't even control their hands yet, and yet everything in them is screaming, someone pick me up, someone hold me, someone, make, someone comfort me. Why is this child feeling this? Because there is an instinct, instinctive fear of the threat of being killed. But the fear of death is not just the fear of, of physical death. The fear of death is also the fear of psychological death which is rejection or abandonment. So the baby's not only wanting to be reassured that it's not about to be killed physically, but the baby is wanting to be reassured that it is 
protected, loved, accepted. It wants nurture and nourishment. And so you draw the child to you, you hold the child, put the child to the breast, and the child begins to nurse, and the child immediately stops crying. That is the very root of the human condition. Because we're born into this world fighting for survival, the need for survival makes us selfish. Did you get that? I mean, don't ever do this, but shout fire in a crowded theater. I mean, don't do it. It's actually illegal. But if you did, what happens? Or you're at the mall and someone hears gunshots. What does everyone do? If, if, shoot back, she said. I hope you're at the mall. If I'm there and it ever happens. (laughs) But what does everybody do? Except the few brave ones among us. Thank God for them. But what does everybody do? You grab your children. You grab the things that matter to you. And you every, it's every man for himself. It's every, now, there are, there are moments of nobility that happen in those times where people do look out for others. But the primary instinct that has to be overcome is self-survival. Am I right? That's the desire, self-survival. You wake up, the house is on fire. You immediately grab the children, everybody, self-survival. Well, this is the human condition. Because we're born dying, we have become slaves to the devil through the fear of death. He manipulates our fear of not having enough. He manipulates our fear of lack. He manipulates our fear of of not belonging. He manipulates our fear of rejection. He manipulates our fear of abandonment, both physical and psychological death, which is alienation or estrangement from life. So he manipulates us, and because we fear death, we become self-survivalists, self-protectionists. And because we then become self-oriented, and it only requires a self to be selfish, which qualifies us all, we then become self-centered and selfish. And when we do, I will then treat you sinfully because I'm trying to look out for number one. That's the source of sin. That's how all humans end up sinning. Jesus was born mortal. He was even born able to die because he later did die. And yet he never sinned. Why? Because he never surrendered to the lie, the self-serving lie rooted in the fear of death. You will not leave my soul in hell. You will not suffer your holy one to see corruption. Jesus never feared death. He He didn't want the shame of the cross. He despised the shame of the cross, but he never feared dying because he knew the Father would raise him from the dead. What are you going to do to a man that rises from the dead? It's like those movies where they just keep coming back. You just can't keep him dead. So what are you going to do to Jesus? He's, so he's not living in fear of death, although he despised the shame. Now, do you see that then? Do you see why that the root of the human condition is the fear of death? This is why people are striving so hard for money. Why? Because money represents, I get to live another day. I not only get to live another day, but I get to increase my power over others. The more money I have, the more powerful I am. The more buying power I have, the more clout I have, the more sway I have, the more influence I have. Now, why do I need that? Because that's the fear of psychological death. Rejection. Abandonment. Now, who in the room besides me has ever dealt with that? The fear of not belonging, the fear of not being included, the fear of being overlooked. All you have to do is stand in a long line waiting to get in somewhere and then see a VIP go in front of you. Hey, we've been waiting here for two hours. Who do they think they are? What am I really saying? What I'm saying is I just got devalued. They're more important than me. They're more valuable than me. This is why people crave perks. And this is why marketers know very well how to manipulate you with VIP programs. This is why marketers know very well how to try to get you to wear your value or drive your value or live in your value. (laughs) Ooh, I'm preaching to you right now. I'm preaching to me too. 
why, why, do, why is this tempting to us? Because we're all looking for immortality. We're all in pursuit. And we're going to talk more about this Wednesday night. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this quest for immortality. And because we're all born dying, we seek significance in institutions or causes that are bigger than ourselves. So we invest ourselves, and we, we go to a particular college. We join a fraternity. We start wearing a, a ring as an a, a alum of a particular university. We start, well, I went here. Well, I went there. What do you do for a living? Well, I do this. I do that. What do you drive? Where do you live? We start looking for all of these markers of success because in reality, what we're looking for underneath it all is we're looking for transcendence. We're looking for immortality. We all know we're dying, and we want to just touch something that seems enduring, something that will last. This is even why people will come to church, which is actually should be the right place to find what you're looking for, because what you're actually looking for is eternal life. God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son, Whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The, the human problem is death. And out of that fear of death, he said, he is going to liberate those who all their lifetime were sl- subject to slavery. <laughs> subject to slavery. Subject to slavery through the fear of death. Now, I've got to say this to you because it is right here where every psychological and physical problem we're facing is resolved. If I can know who I am in Christ and receive my life from Him and understand, as Jesus says, that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. If I can understand that, that my life is in Christ, then out of the life of Christ comes freedom from slavery through the fear of death. Satan is manipulating your fear of not belonging, your fear of being devalued. That's psychological, sort of a virtual death. He's he's manipulating that. Your self-consciousness, your low self-image, your low self-worth. How many people, I wonder, end up being enslaved into all sorts of things they shouldn't be involved in? Whether it's debt, whether it's addictions, whether it's unhealthy relationships, and they get pulled into sin because they are so desperate to belong, desperate to be seen as significant, desperate for success. And Satan ends up tricking you through a lie, just like he did Adam and Eve, and you end up trying to find your God-likeness, your transcendence, your immortality, your eternal life. You start trying to find it at a tree of performance. And that's how we end up at religion. And that's how we end up trying to find it in politics or in making money or in business or in any other thing. We even try to find it in relationships. We talked on Friday night at our couples deal. Gina and I talked about the single greatest thing Gina and I have ever learned about a happy marriage is that she is not my source and I am not hers. God is my source. God is her source. And if I orient myself toward him and she orients herself toward him, then we will be properly oriented toward one another. It's a perfect triangle. Do you see that? This is, this is the secret. This is why life is such a big deal in the Scripture. Here's what Jesus said. John 5 and 24. Verily, truly. In the Greek, it's actually amen, amen. <laughs> amen, amen. If you've ever been like me, a little Pentecostal kid, counting how many times the preacher said Amen. Probably no one but me ever did that. But when I was growing up, we had these preachers. They were wild-eyed Pentecostal preachers. And brother, they had filler words like you wouldn't believe. They were constant, hey man, hey man, hey man. And so you'd, you'd, you'd count how many times they would say amen in that message. It was, it was awesome. So Jesus, uh, he does this, amen, amen. It's all through the book of John. Amen, amen. I tell you, everyone look right at me and say, Steve, focus, please. Thank you very much. All right. John 5, 24. Very truly, I tell you, anyone, look at this, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life 
and does not come under judgment. Which means what? I no longer fear death. This is what John says in 1 John chapter 4. I no longer fear judgments because perfect love has cast out my fear. So because I'm no longer fearing judgment from you or from anyone else, I don't care whether you judge me for what I drive. I don't care whether you judge me for what I wear. I want to drive nice vehicles. I want to wear nice clothes. I want to live in a nice home. That's all. But I don't want those things because I'm trying to get your positive judgment. No, no, no. No, my life doesn't come from the things I possess. My life comes from my fellowship, face-to-face communion with him. So I hear his word, I believe his word, and then I know because his word is a word of no condemnation, I know I'm no longer coming under judgment. I no longer have to fear the judgment. Then he says, you have passed from death to life. Okay, John 6 and 63. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So how do I come alive in Christ? Through the word and the spirit. Through the word and the spirit, which is literally the spirit carried word. It is the word that the spirit carries into my heart. So I hear the word, and I receive by the Spirit the faith to believe it. And in that moment, as he said in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your sins and your trespasses in which you once lived, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we once all lived, again, after the lusts of the flesh, following the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as all the rest. Did you get that? You were dead in sins and trespasses, and because you were dead, you were susceptible to the pressure of the world, the devil, and the flesh. Or to put it in a more biblical and personal order, the flesh, the world, the devil. This is what you were susceptible to because you were dead. But when life comes, life comes and your spirit comes alive. And then the the transformation of the spirit opens up in your belly. A well in your belly. Or as I've often preached, a belly in your well. Or a bell in your welly, I even said one time. (laughs) It can really be bad to talk a lot in front of people. It opens up in your your deepest soul, your spirit. The well of the spirit opens up and then flows up. Here's how transformation happens. The spirit flows into your human spirit, giving life to you who were dead. And then as the life of God comes into your spirit, into your belly, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching out the deepest parts of the belly. As he begins to come into the deepest parts of you, he then begins to flow up into your soul, which is your emotions, your will, and your mind. And you begin to feel differently, decide differently, and think differently. And you begin to be transformed. Your whole spirit, soul, and body begins to be sanctified, as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5. And the spirit comes up into you, and the life of God begins to flow into your emotions. And those threatened emotions, scared of rejection, begin to be healed by the acceptance that you have found in Christ. And suddenly pressures off of my wife, because she's not my Jesus. And pressure is off my children because they're not my Jesus. And pressure's off of you as a congregation as I stand here preaching. I don't have to stand here and count all the empty chairs. You know that's what pastors do. They look around and see who's not there. But I don't have to stand in the room and worry about all of that because my life's not coming from how many people applaud when I preach a good sermon. My life's coming from Him. And your life's not coming from your work It's not coming from your career. It's not coming from how much money you make. It's not coming from what you own or what you possess or what you drive or what kind of shoes you put on. It doesn't come from all of that. And then once you get your life from Jesus, you still get to have all of that. 
You still get to enjoy all of that, but now you can enjoy it without unrealistic expectations of a life source from things that cannot give you life. And now you step into a place of life and peace. And that life that's flowing up through your belly begins to flow through your emotions, through your will, through your mind. You begin to make better decisions. You begin to have a better mindset. The neural pathways of your brain begin to be regrooved by your new way of thinking. And you come into new habits and you're no longer caught in the course of the world or the course of this of the prince of the power of the air. You're no longer caught up in the mob movements of the world towards self-destruction. And now you begin to live out the destiny for which you were created before time began, when you were still a piece of God, a line of code that emerged from God and was implanted into your mother's womb and became you, the living image of God. Mm. Do you get what I just preached? This is it, man. This is life change right here. This is life change right here. So I look to Christ as my life. John 10 and 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have. Why? Why, why did you come to give us life? Because we were dead. Because death is the problem. Death is the enemy. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is Death. Death was the problem. So, now when he gives us life, and let me see if I can wrap it up right here. We'll come back next week and talk some more about it. And if you really want to go deep with me, come Wednesday. If death is the problem and the life of Jesus is the solution, then that's exactly what the cross fixed. In the cross, Jesus defeated death. How did he defeat death? Well, because he rose from the dead. I mean, that's pretty embarrassing for death. Because, I mean, you only had one job. It's like death only has one thing to do, and that's keep you dead. And yet Jesus does what? He lives again. And when he comes alive, death is broken. Then guess what happens? He then comes to live in you as the spirit of resurrection. And you come alive in Christ. Now, when you come alive, Hebrews says that Jesus came that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. John also says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil by giving us life. So he came that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and that he might free or liberate those who, who all their lifetime were subject to slavery through the fear of death. Enslaved to what? Enslaved to the passions of the flesh. Now, this is Ephesians 2 again. Paul talks about three things that we follow, that we're dragged along behind. Number one is the flesh, the impulses of the flesh. There's a lot of times a lot of people say the devil made me do it when the devil didn't have anything to do with it at all. In fact, I think there's a lot of people the devil goes on vacation. Because it's like, shoot, they're better at this than I am. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't take lessons from some people. Like, whew, that was actually pretty, that was pretty devilish of them. I think I'll... I don't know if I'm making that up or not, but I'm just telling that there are some things that happen in your life that are the flesh. They are works of the flesh. Now, that doesn't mean the enemy doesn't exploit those things or inflame those things or even sometimes possess or demonize those things. Certainly he does. But it is to say that when, when the Lord deals with the devil, when he deals with the devil, how does he deal with him? He defeats death by giving life To you and me, which does what? It makes my dead flesh come alive in Christ. I who was dead in my sins and trespasses have been made alive together with God in Christ. By grace you are saved. He has raised us up together and made us to sit together with him in heavenly places. But God, mm, I heard a preacher preach two hours on but God. Bishop Morris Golder from Indianapolis, he's about that tall, one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. But God, 
who is rich in mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, for by grace you are saved. So what happens? God deals with the death problem by putting life inside you. And now, Paul said, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ. So we receive the spirit of life, and we now begin to reckon or calculate that the flesh, the old man, is put to death in Christ. And now I am a new self. I've put off the old self, and I've put on the new self. Paul said, put on the new self like a garment. And so now I'm going to live from a new way of thinking out of my belly, into my soul, out of my body, out of my fingertips, out of my eyes, my mouth, my ears, every part of me, I begin to be transformed. Okay, then what happens? When that happens, then the other enemy, which is the world, begins to be brought into proper balance because now no longer am I serving the fear of man. I'm no longer serving to be a, a people pleaser. But now I begin to establish godly boundaries in my relationships. Ooh, I'm preaching right now. I begin to establish godly boundaries in my relationships. Why? Because I have a new source of life. I don't now need my life to come from my father or my mother or my brother or my sister. Now, it doesn't mean that I dishonor them. It means that I do not see them as my Jesus. I do not see them as my Christ life. But I look to Christ as my life. And now I can interact and relate to them in a healthy way because I'm no longer governed by fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. All right. Then the third enemy is what? The devil. Flesh, world, and devil. And in Christ, I am made alive. So then what happens? Because Christ has defeated death, I am now, say it with me, free. I am now free. I am free to live my life without being manipulated by the flesh, the world, and the devil. And I come into the freedom. And here's what he says in Galatians 5. We'll we'll conclude with these two passages. Galatians 5 and 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. You're already free, but you have to know that so you can come into the freedom you already have. Did you get that? For freedom, Christ has already made us free. That's the gospel. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let me just stop and say this one thing, because this is hugely important. When you get the order of the fall or the order of the human problem mixed up, when you say that sin produces death, then you have people who are constantly trying to perform In other words, I'm trying to stop sinning so I can live. Did y'all get that? That's what religion will tell you. I got to stop sinning so I can live. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is the problem is death. God fixes the problem of death by giving you life. And because you live, you now can become free. Do you see that? So now... I'm no longer dead, I'm alive in Christ, so now my righteousness is a result of that life. So instead of stop sinning so you can live, it is live so you can stop sinning. Well, when I get all my act together, one of these days, man, I'm going to get all cleaned up and I'm going to come to church. It's like, no, uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh. Come on to church. Well, one of these days when I get real, when I get my act together and I stop drinking, man, then I'm, I'm going to serve Jesus. Nope, nope, nope. Bring your, bring your whiskey bottle. Just come on. Come on to Jesus, whiskey and all. And when you get to Jesus with your whiskey bottle and you got some weed in your pocket and you got you some cigarettes up here in your, in your shirt pocket or wrapped up in your sleeve, you know, if you're wearing a T-shirt. Come on now. Say, well, I got a porn problem, man. I can't stop. I'm addicted to porn. I'll tell you what, when I get, when I get all cleaned up and I get victim, then I'm going to come and serve Jesus. You're going to spend the rest of your life fighting with that addiction. You need to come to Jesus just as you are and let Jesus give you life. And if you will let him give you life, then your righteousness will flow out of the righteousness of Christ. 
Stand with me so I know I'm done. And let me read one, one final passage, okay? We're going to come back and talk about this some more again next Sunday. And again, Wednesday night, I'm serious. We're going to go deep into this Wednesday night. We'll have discussion, answers, and questions. Join me on Wednesday. But let me read one more passage here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I want you to see this because this gathers up everything I'm saying and nails it to the idea of transformation, okay? Everybody listening close? Here it is, 2 Corinthians 3. Now, when people stand, their ears go off, so turn them back on. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, say it, freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, this is how transformation happens. It is in the environment of the life of the Spirit that you are made free. And it is when you live free, you can become or you will become transformed. Say this with me. As I live free, I'm going to say it again. As I live free, I am transformed. Say it with me again. As I live free, I am transformed. Stop trying to produce transformation in the flesh. Stop trying to produce transformation from peer pressure, from the world around you. Stop trying to produce transformation from religious rules and self-righteousness. The only way transformation is coming is you have to live free. So go out and get you a t-shirt before you leave and wear it home as a prophetic declaration. I will live free in the name of Jesus. Now, I don't have time to talk about Ezekiel 47 and the Transformation River. We'll do it next week. But I want to lead you in a proclamation of life and freedom. I want, to, I want to lead you in a live free confession of faith. So I want you, if you will, you can put your hands over your heart and put your hands out in front of you. I want you to just get in a stance or in a position of receiving whatever that feels like to you. I want you to close your eyes so you can get locked in on the face of, of Christ himself. And I want you to say this with me. Lord Jesus... You are my life. I have heard your word of no judgment, of no condemnation, and I believe it. You've given me faith to believe it. So I believe you are my life. Because you are my life, I am no longer dead. I am no longer afraid of death either physical or psychological. I am not afraid of rejection. I am not afraid of abandonment. I am not afraid of alienation. I am not afraid of separation. For no matter where I am, who I'm with, you are my life. And you are more than enough. And because you are my life, I am free. I am free from slavery. I am free from addiction. I am free from fear. I want you to say it even if you don't think it's true. I am free from fear. There is no fear of judgment. For I am accepted in the beloved. I am accepted in Christ. And because I live free, I am being transformed. And because I am being transformed, I am a transformer. In Jesus' name, somebody give the Lord some high praise right now. Now, if you, if you made that confession with me today for the very first time, and maybe you not have not been a believer up until this moment, and you've made that confession of faith with me, that is the confession of faith 
in the gospel that you just made. And I want to help you take your next step in becoming a follower of Jesus. I want you to fill out a connect card. You say, what's that got to do with it? Well, on the connect card, there is a little place for you to say, today I made a decision to follow Jesus. And if you'll let us know that you made that decision today, you can even come down. Our prayer team is going to come here in just a moment. You can even come down and let them know. But we want to know that you made that decision to follow Jesus today. And we want to help you take your next step toward baptism, being filled with the Spirit, and becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. So please make sure you let us know that you made that decision. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your people. And I pray that you would go with us. I pray that you would bless the Super Bowl. Mostly bless the wings that we're going to eat in Jesus' name. But Father, I pray that you'd help us have a great day. And I want us to take the kingdom out into the world and live it out in reality. We are free because of you. We live free. And thank you. Can everyone say thank you, Lord? Our prayer team is coming right now. The way we love to close at Freedom Life is our worship team comes back. We do what we call overflow. This gives you a time to linger if you'd like. You can hang around a bit. Just kind of linger in the presence of the Lord. Come up and receive prayer if you need prayer. If you need to go, we certainly understand. A lot of you have plans today. And we want to bless you as you head out into I'll start to say the real world, but man, this is the real world. The presence of Jesus is more real than anything in the world. That's right. So I want you to carry it with you in the name of Jesus. Can I put the blessing on you? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I want you to go in the boldness of the cross of Jesus Christ and walk in his resurrection. Have a great week. Many blessings.